Welcome everyone. This is Colleen McCarthy O'Toole from the Carissa Mays Family Support Department. Thanks so much for joining us today for our first Summit of Strength webinar of 2021. We'd also really like to thank our national presenting sponsors, Biogen and Genentech, as well as our platinum sponsor, Acredo, and supporting sponsor, Scholarock, for their generous support of the 2021 Summit of Strength webinar series. We appreciate all of the questions that we've received in advance of today's webinar, and we're gonna to try to answer as many of these as possible. You can also submit questions throughout the webinar using the questions box, which you'll find located on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Please note that all lines will remain muted during the webinar other than for the speakers. If you have any additional questions after today's presentation and Q&A, please contact the QRSMA Family Support Team at familysupport at qrsma.org. We would now like to welcome our speaker, Melissa McIntyre, physical therapist from the University of Utah, who will be sharing her presentation, Adaptive Sports and Novel Adaptive Equipment, the University of Utah Trails Program. Melissa? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be giving this presentation. I've got my QRSMA colored theme jacket on and everything. Uh, it's really fun to give this presentation because I'm giving one about a program that is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I met my husband growing, uh, volunteering for this program and it's been part of both of our lives for a fair few years now. Uh, so I just wanted to start off the, pro the talk by stating the obvious. I'm gonna talk about an adaptive sports program uh, and a lot of these types of activities are limited due to COVID-19. Uh, so normally I'm used to giving this talk as pictured in this slide. Uh, this was in 2019 and this was my husband and I giving this talk, uh, one of the old key rest and some of the traits. So things have changed, uh, but I'd really like to give this one with really a look to as things improve and we can start getting together more, um, something to look forward to and something to think about and plan on maybe trying to come out and see us or one of our kind of partner programs that we'll talk about later. Next slide. Okay, so next thing I wanna show a little bit is about Utah. Um, it's a beautiful place. It's a fun place to work and play. This is a photo of the University of Utah and you can see that we're nestled right into the mountains, which are very near and dear to my heart. I'm a happiest when I'm in the mountains. Um, next slide. So just another photo of Utah. This is a little bit more what it looks like now. Uh, snow covered, we're snow covered at this point in time. Um, so come visit us, don't stay. It's getting a little crowded, but come visit us when things are looking better um, COVID wise. So next slide. So now I wanna talk a little bit more about my favorite subject in the world, which is me. Uh, kidding, uh, but a little bit of background on what I do as part of my day-to-day -day life is I work for the University of Utah. They do a lot of stuff. Uh, within the University of Utah, I work for a program called Utah Program for Inherited Neuromuscular Disorders, or UPIN for short. And what we are is we are a multidisciplinary care team and a translational research team uh, for inherited neuromuscular disorders. Under that group, I'm a physical therapist. So clinical evaluator of multiple pharmaceutical trials as well as natural history. And I play a role in clinical care as part of our uh, team. So next slide. So I always like to give this presentation a bit and just say where this started for me by where this started for me within the neuromuscular field is I was seeing a lot of study participants and patients in settings similar to what is pictured on this slide. This is our study assessment room on the left and the six minute walk course on the right. I'm sure this is a setting that is familiar to a fair few of you. And what kind of came across to me is that I would come in, I would see study patients and participants and, you know, we get to know each other and, and we become friends and I would go, we would leave and I would go about my day and I'd go home and do the things I like to do and they'd go home and they'd do the things they like to do. Uh, and so the most of our lives are taking out taking place outside of this really kind of clinical environment. Uh, next slide. 
So that got me thinking about things as well. Some really helpful insights that I had from individuals I was working with. And one of the individuals I was working with really kind of structured uh, my thought process on this, which is what is rehabilitation? And we see this really long definition, which I even kind of teased down from the World Health Organization, uh, which is really focused on optimizing function and reducing individuals um, experience of disability. And so that me, that screams everyday life to me. When we talk about rehabilitation and improving that, we're talking about improving function in our everyday life. Uh, and then how does physical therapy fall into that? And physical therapy is really thinking about improving human motor function or uh, limiting impairment. And that really takes place in the clinic. And we think of where what we do in the clinic uh, as physical therapists, how does that apply to real life? And to me, that's what rehabilitation is, is really applying some of those skills and those things we do to real life and every day and, and employing that function. And it's our responsibility, both as individuals, as physical therapists, as people who go to physical therapy to make that push forward into kind of that rehabilitation side of things. Uh, so next slide. And then another thing I started thinking about is with that idea of rehabilitation and going into everyday activities and life is if I'm asked to describe myself, what do I say? Well, I list a lot of those activities. Uh, like I said earlier, anything where I'm in the mountains, I'm a happy, I'm a happy person. Uh, and that's a large part of who I am. And as I thought about that, I thought about, well, what barriers do I face when accessing these things? And on top of that, what tools are available uh, to address these barriers. And I have some tools, I have things, and I have barriers, but my barriers are very different than another person's barriers. And they're especially different um, than anybody who has limitations to their mobility or their strength or function. So from that, um, I started really thinking about how can we address some of these things. And so if we can go to the next slide. And whenever we think about addressing these things, the word adaptive comes up, right? As we think about adaptive equipment and modifying things. And so I started thinking about, well, what are the barriers when the word adaptive is involved, right? Because if you put medical equipment or adaptive in front of anything, the first thing that happens is the price goes up by a long shot. Um, so adaptive equipment, I just kind of have these bulleted lists. They're expensive. Uh, I really believe there's a decreased innovation in the field. Uh, and there's a difficulty customizing these things to what individuals really need. And with a combination of those, a decrease in innovation and difficult to customize, a lot of the equipment just isn't appropriate for those with pronounced physical limitations. And we can see as we work to the right-hand side of this slide that those same limitations that we see in adaptive equipment then kind of permeate into adaptive sports. They're expensive. They often don't maximize independence in these activities. And I think there's a low focus on people with complex physical limitations. And then whenever we're engaging in any of these things, we really have to think about safety. Um, adaptive sports and sporting in general, you try to in, have things as safe as possible, but you know you are at a higher risk. And sometimes that risk can be even higher if there's a poor understanding um, so of the risk associated with a given diagnosis. Um, and really need to have an understanding that injuries can result in permanent loss of function and, and take account for that. Next slide. So those are all things I thought about kind of as this process got started. And here are some things I didn't think about that really came up later. Uh, one's own personal belief about adaptive sports. I heard from a couple individuals that I've worked with. They said, well, you know, I just really don't want to fall in love with something. Um, if I'll be unable to do it later. Uh, and then the other thing was individuals' previous experience and interest in adaptive sports. So has someone had a previous experience that would make them reluctant to try a type of sport again? Um, or really a big one is what I find most interesting or exciting isn't always what others find most interesting or exciting. We all have our own preferences um, and we ha all have our own things that we like to do. Uh, next slide. So with all this in mind, 
um, really what arose was a collaboration between Trails, which is the program I talked about earlier uh, that I've spent a long time with, and my kind of routine day-to-day -day job of working under UPIN. So Trails is a program that I volunteered with before P PT school, during PT school. And then I kind of got my job working in the field and didn't have as much time and wasn't working with them as actively. And through a little bit of experience, I really saw how some of the equipment that trials have could really help our neuromuscular population, which wasn't highly involved in trials at the time. Uh, so what I did is I, I gave them a call. I've known them for a long time. And I said, hey, I would like to start bringing over some of our neuromuscular patients and to trails and everything great that they are and all their credit. They said, absolutely, let's do it. And we started that, that you know, immediately after that meeting, kind of bringing people in and, and uh, seeing how we could do this. Next slide. So as I've kind of introduced trails, I really wanted to give a little bit of an outline to I feel the approach that take that trails takes to the word adaptive. We talked about barriers when the word adaptive involved. And this is the approach that I really feel trails has taken over the years. So on the left, we have that kind of arrow is percentage of independence represented by that middle bar as well. Um, and what we can really see here is that we, as far as independence goes, we have two competing factors. We have limitations to strength and mobility, kind of pushing down that in, uh, independence with activities. And then we have a, adaptive equipment trying to push that bar back up. And whether it's adaptive sporting equipment or durable medical equipment, they're all trying to push back up that level of independence. And we might not get it to 100% independent, uh, depending on the individual, but that's the goal, right? Is to get it as independent as possible. Next slide. So I've kind of given a lot of sparse information, talked about some of the things I thought about, talked about some of Trails approach. So now I just want to give a fly overview of what Trails is. So Trails got to start spinal cord injury. Uh, we started by a physician here at the University of Utah named Jeffrey Rosenbluth who specializes in spinal cord injuries. He really took on a novel approach to designing innovative adaptive equipment to address needs and came up with this program, which stands for Technology, Recreation, Access, Independence, Lifestyle, Sports. I can never remember everything it stands for, uh, so I just very fondly call it Trails. Next slide. So a fly overview of Trails is Trails does about 14,000 annual program hours of sports and recreation um, a year. Really what that means is almost every day of the week, uh, Trails is doing something. Activities include alpine skiing, cross-country skiing, cycling, water sports, uh, shooting, tennis, Nordic walking. We're gonna talk about two of those today. We're gonna talk about the water sports and we're gonna talk about skiing. Uh, not included on this list, but also part of Trails is uh, wellness programs, uh, adaptive yoga, things like that. Next slide. So I have talked a lot about trail, kind of what they do, and I can't give this talk without talking about the people who make it happen. There's been a lot of hard work over a lot of years going into this program. So on the top left is Dr. Jeffrey Rosenbluth. Uh, he's really the starter of this program. Um, he's the mastermind behind it. Uh, and he's one of the main engines that drives it forward. Another main engine is, engine is Tanya Kari, who's next to Jeff on that row. Uh, Tanya always rolled her eyes when I insist on pointing this out, but Tanya is actually a multiple time gold medalist in the Paralympic Games and has been inducted into the Finnish Hall of Fame. Uh, so it's been really a fantastic thing for Trails to have her insight into the world of adaptive sports. Um, and then underneath that is Keegan. He's the guy kind of wearing the hat. He is our program manager. Uh, and then among that is mechanical engineers, computer scientists, physical therapists, everybody that kind of helped drive this program forward and support it over the years. Next slide. So I, as we go about the rest of this presentation, I'm going to show a lot of photos. Uh, the majority of it's going to be photos. We're going to have some videos at the end. But I would say out of every single photo I show you, 
um, and the videos, this photo is my very favorite because I think it sums up the work accessibility that we face in our day-to-day -day lives so well. So this is a reservoir in Utah where we do a lot of our sailing and kayaking programs. And that sidewalk that you see on the right-hand side of the photo is the end of the wheelchair accessible ramp to the water. Um, you're, you know, and I kind of think of this as, uh, as thinking about accessing it. If you need that wheelchair accessible ramp, you show up, you're getting ready to go to the water, and you've still got this very large barrier in the form of mud and sand and rocks in your way. And so the question is, is what can we do to address these? And that's really the approach Trails has taken over the years. Next slide. So now I'm gonna really start talking about programs and some of the equipment that we have and that Trails has designed um, to make, to address some of those barriers. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is kayaking and sailing. And there's some things I'd like to just point out in this photo. Uh, so if you look at the individual in the front, uh, there's kind of that pole coming up in between that's holding the paddle. Uh, that's a pretty simple piece of equipment, but what it does is it holds up the paddle so he doesn't have to support that weight, as well as it pivots. And so if he has weakness on one side versus the other, or one side is stronger than the other, he can actually use his stronger side to help drive that stroke on both sides. Um, as we work our way back along the kayak, you can see those two little kind of floating yellow things that are attached to it. That makes the kayak really stable because um, we don't want any tipping. So that helps stabilize, stabilize that kayak. Um, so these are pretty simple modifications that we've made over the years that have been really helpful. Uh, the other thing we'll see in a, in a couple more photos, you'll see a better shot of it, is all of our seating and positioning equipment can be put into these kayaks or sailboats to really give somebody as much support as what they would have, say, in their power wheelchair. So we can offer lateral supports, rojo cushions, so forth. Um, as we work back in that photo behind the individual in red that's standing behind the yellow kayak, you can see that kind of board. Um, and that's a safety board connected to like a jet ski. And we always have that safety boat out on the water whenever individuals are out. Uh, as just, a, just in case, if there's any form of medical emergency or so forth that people need to get back quickly for, we can utilize that. Uh, the main reason I really like to point this out is Trails holds, holds claim to, and we are very proud of it, that we are the first program to get the University of Utah to buy a jet ski. So that's a pretty big deal for us. Next slide. So this is one of the things that Trails has created over years, and this is uh, a portable dock uh, that we've created. So next slide. So that whole dock will actually fold out. So that photo that we saw before, this is the same equipment. It's just folded out with the sides up, ramp put out, and we can transport it to and from. It just hauls like a boat on a trailer. And a few things I wanna kind of point out is if you look on the very back, we'll see another view of this. You can see that boat with like the tall sail, that little blue bar coming up. It's kind of sitting out of the back of the dock. So that's our sailboat. We'll talk more about it in a second. But what you can see is that it's sitting there and sitting on a very stable surface. So this is where we can do all our transfers. We can pull that sailboat in, we can transfer individuals in, we can get them set up with whatever seating and positioning they need, whatever drive system they need. And then that whole thing that the sailboat sitting on will actually lower down, it's like a ramp, it'll lower down and we can launch individuals into the water. They can go out sailing, they can come back. That ramp can be lowered back down, the sailboat can come on, we can hook on a winch and it can come up and pull individuals in, we transfer out. Meanwhile, their wheelchair, whatever mobility device they need is hanging out on the dock. Um, so it's a really stable surface to do transfers. Before we had this dock, we were doing transfers in kind of the environment that that yellow kayak is sitting in. So it wasn't ideal. Um, and this really gives us time to make sure that we need everything. It's really cool under there. Um, and it's worked quite well. The other thing that's on this is if you look on the right hand side of the photo, you can see that little ramp. And that ramp is fully accessible for power wheelchairs or manual wheelchairs. That's how we get on and off the dock. Uh, next slide. So this is another view of the dock. Um, once again, you can see that sailboat hanging out back there. 
you can get a good um, visualization of what the surface of the dock looks like. So it's really stable, really great place to do transfers. The last thing to kind of note in this is you can see that yet yeah, kayak and how it's kind of on these two prongs. So what those prongs do is they actually raise and lower. So that system set up that that kayak can be there. We can un take out a pin and rotate that whole uh, mechanism onto the inside of the boat. Individuals can transfer. We can always raise and lower it. So they're doing a level transfer. Rotate them back out once they're in the kayak and that will then lower down into the water. So that's been a really helpful uh, addition as well. And then you can also see an individual there. It's a really good surface um, for wheelchairs to be on and easy to push. And if we take a look, if we go to the next slide, we can see that the individual is accessing it, um, the dock via a wheelchair accessible ramp. Um, and as I said, it is plenty strong for basically any power wheelchair as well. Next slide. So now we're just going to keep talking about equipment. So specifically, as I give this talk, we're really focusing in on the most advanced type of equipment that trails have, uh, one of which is this sailboat. So this is a sailboat that has been adapted to be able to be driven via wheelchair joystick control or a sip and puff drive mechanism that's commonly associated with a wheelchair. You can control the sail, propeller, turns, all of that, all the driving is done through either wheelchair joystick controls or sip and puff. In this photo, you can also see a better vis visualization of some of the seating options I mentioned. You can see that there's the options for lateral support and so forth, and as well as head support as well. Um, and then this is an individual on the right who I actually saw during clinic uh, one day, and I got him talked into coming out that following weekend. And he's driving the sailboat via the sip and puff mechanism. Next slide. So this is just a still shot of what it looks like from out front of the boat on a nice sail day, which usually requires some wind. Um, the sailboat can get moving pretty quick. And in the next slide, so we can go ahead and go to that. We can see the individual who's driving the boat. So all I did was to snap those two together was to take the first part of the clip before it pans around to this individual. And he's driving the boat solely through a sip and puff mechanism. He's actually using a ventilator. So we were able to put the ventilator on with him. Um, and it was a beautiful day out there. Uh, this is actually a clip we'll show at the end. Uh, so kind of keep this in mind. Really the only issue I have with this photo is he's a my Dol my Miami Dolphins fan. And my husband is a very passionate, passionate Buffalo Bills fan and those two don't get along. Next slide, please. So now we're going to shift out of the water sports and we're going to talk about downhill skiing. And as I mentioned before, this presentation is really focusing on the most advanced technology that trails has and has created. Uh, that being said, adaptive equipment exists across the spectrum and trails has equipment um, that exists across that spectrum for what people need. So this is my good friend Wally. He has a paraplegic injury, uh, which means he really doesn't have any functional use below his waist. Uh, but he is one of the best monoskiers I know. Um, and this is maybe not a really great shot of his monoski that he uses, but a really cool shot of him skiing. So I want to throw it in there. Uh, next slide. So <clears throat> this is photos of what we call the Tetra ski. That name comes from um, if we talk about individuals that have a spinal cord injury that affects all four limbs, it's known as tetraplegia. So tetra really is coming from the idea that all four limbs are affected. Uh, and this ski has the exact same technology as the sailboat I talked about before, is that it can be driven using, or it can be skied is a better word. It can be skied using sip and puff or uh, wheelchair drive controls, or like a joystick. They're different controls, but a joystick. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see these kind of actuators that will articulate the skis or flatten out the skis. Uh, next slide.
so now we're just going to kind of as we go through these photos i'm going to show kind of each component that goes along with skiing and the tetris ski so what we can see here is that someone is tethered behind the tetris ski that's actually the ski instructor for the day uh one of my favorite things about the ski is you know it's you got it's a ski you got to learn to ski uh and so you actually need an instructor to kind of teach you how to ski this uh as well as he's tethered to the ski to act as an emergency brake if needed um this is not a small piece of equipment so as such it can gather some speed and really for safety reasons we have to have someone tethered to it um just in case we need a very quick stop next slide But what you can see is that the majority of the time, once, once individuals learn to ski and they're really proficient at it, um, that, that line is relatively slack. Like I said, they're really there just to act as an emergency break as needed. Um, this individual that is in the ski right now is actually four years old at the time of this photo. Uh, he would traditionally ski in a front backpack with his dad, but he was getting too big up for that. So we came, uh, they were really interested in trying, and man, he had a good day. He would only say one word the entire day. It was very quiet, but the only word he would say was jump all day long. Um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. And one of my favorite things about this photo and why I have this in here is you can see that he is so small that we actually had to take a couple two by four and mount them to the ski so he could have a foot rest because his feet didn't reach the traditional foot rest. In the center where you see his hands, um, that's one of the joystick options that we have uh, that he's using to drive the ski. And you can see that we still have that person tethered. Next slide. And we will have a video of skiing at the end of the lecture. Um, a couple things I wanna point out in this photo is this is another individual skiing. I believe this was his first day out. You can't really see it in the photo, but that instructor in his right hand that's not holding the rope actually has a remote control that can override the ski if needed. Uh, and this is, you know, there, it's a safety component as well as the tether of being able to, if we need to override the ski or ski it down um, via the remote control, we can. But really the main thing that it is, is it's a teaching tool. Um, as with anybody, uh it's funny because individuals have always have one dominant turn they always catch on to one turn skiing faster than they do the other um and so a really good example of that is like if a person's having a hard time with a right hand turn on the ski the instructor can use that remote to help guide that and teach them how that feels and then as they become proficient they can learn it and then usually once individuals are more have you know really spent some good time in the ski that remote is typically dangling down by the side. Uh, next slide. The other thing I really uh, love about trails, and I really feel it's a foundation of what trails does, is um, everything is actually free of charge to participants and their families. So if an individual wants to ski for the day, uh, lift tickets, ski lesson, all of that's taken care of. Lift tickets for family members as long as they're skiing with them actively that day, that's taken care of. And so this individual was able to ski with his family. Um, he insisted his dad come, and he was a lot better skier than his dad was a snowboarder. I don't know if you've caught the snowboarder in the background that's primarily showing the bottom of his board. That's his dad. Uh, so next slide. And I just couldn't resist zooming in on that. <laughs> um, dad had a long day uh but it was it was a great day out there um next slide so i will have a video of this later that shows it better but one question we always get is how does the ski get on and off the chairlift so what the whole ski does is it actually hinge up their chairlift will come around underneath and then the ski sets down on the chairlift and you just take off uh, so the nice thing about that is once you're transferred into the ski and set up, you don't transfer out again until you're done skiing for the day. Next slide. 
And that's just a photo of the ski on the chairlift. Next slide. So another thing that trails noticed was a barrier is that sometimes people's ability to get out to ski is a little bit limited or get out to fail is a little bit limited. Or if you're nervous about trying it, you're not sure about the joystick setup that you'd like to use and you don't wanna be messing around with it on a cold day on the mountain. Uh, what they created was a skiing and sailing sim simulator, computer simulator. This is a photo of the ski one, but we have one for the sail as well. And what individuals can do is they can come in and practice on the simulator, uh, figure out, program what controls they like. If it's sip and puff, you can program, you know, how many sips for this, how many sips for that. And all that programming that you do on the simulator can then be transferred over to the ski, just transferred right over. And then you can also play around with what joystick or this or that and get some practice of just how the ski works. And that really kind of hedges some of the learning curve uh, prior to when you get on the mountain. Uh, initially, this was on like a computer screen, which is individual sitting on the on a chair and kind of holding a joystick or using the slip and puff. Uh, but they are working doing this with VR, so like the VR goggles and so forth. And that's really cool to use the VR. Uh, next slide. So <clears throat> this whole talk so far has talked about adaptive equipment to help address some of the physical barriers to accessing things like sailing or skiing, um, you know, unique drive systems and so forth. One thing I haven't talked about is the fact that I'm talking about a program that's based in Salt Lake City, Utah, and you guys are not necessarily all based in Salt Lake City, Utah, and so there's a geographical barrier there. Next slide. So trails, one thing they've done to try to help address this geographical barrier is create this basically offshoot program called Tetra, Tetra Adapt. Um, Tetra Adapt's a nonprofit and it's really focused towards distributing some of this equipment that's been created through trails and through the University of the Utah to adaptive sports programs across the nation and even outside of the US. Next slide. So the structure they took with the Tetra Ski uh, and will at some point take along take that same structure with the sailboat uh, is collaborating with adaptive sports program and loaning out the equipment. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we haven't been able to go about this, go about that this year the same way we had planned. Um, there is a ski in Canada and France, I believe, uh, but we were unable to send out more skis due to travel restrictions. Um, results from COVID-19. Uh, the program we had going in 2019 to 2020 is we brought in a bunch of ski instructors from different adaptive sports programs. They came for, I think it was five days to a week worth of training uh, with the instructors we have here on how to use the ski, um, really making sure every box was checked um, safety-wise and getting familiar with it. And then we sent them home with the ski and they had the ski for the season or some had them for like half a season and sent them to another adaptive sports program. And those skis kind of traveled around the US. And then at the end of the season, they came back, we repaired them, we updated them, and then handed them out the following season. Uh, that same structure is gonna at some point happen with the boats as well. Uh, and hopefully as restrictions, COVID-19 gets better and restrictions lighten, this program is, we're still planning on putting this back in place. Next slide. So I, this slide's just in here because we get, I get this question a lot. Uh, how do you kind of pull this off, uh, especially if everything's free of charge for participants? Um, and how do we expand the access? Grants have up to this point been a very large portion of trails and tetra, tetra adapt. Um, and they will continue to be a large portion of it. Private donors have donated some money as well. And Tetra adapt has opened up uh, some crowdsourced funding. Uh, when appropriate. Next slide, please. So these, these next two slides are really just informational slides for you. Uh, below is the web link, the website in blue is the website to Tetra Adapt. 
Um, on the right is a QR code that you can scan with your phone and it'll take you right to the Tetra Adapt webpage. Uh, if you scroll to the bottom of that webpage, you'll see this sign up to stay informed. That adds you to an email list um, if you just kind of like routine reminders. I'm on the email list. It's not too, you don't get too many notifications or anything, but it's a nice reminder of what's going on. Uh, next slide. So, so far I've talked a lot about the, I mentioned a lot of the limitations that COVID-19 has put on kind of the outreach of this program. However, one of the really great things that came from it is a really great trails website, which we didn't have prior. Um, it just launched a couple months ago. Uh, you can go on that website. You can see photos of all of trails equipment, um, learn more about the people involved. You can contact them. Uh, so the website, same structure as the previous slide. The website is in blue below. Um, you can join their newsletter. Similar to the Tetra Adapt one, it's not a big spam thing or anything like that. You usually just get kind of a monthly update. We're, get, you know, we're scheduling for skiing. We have these things going, stuff like that. Um, and then a QR code that'll take you to the website. Okay, next slide, please. And this is normally a photo that like slowly, or a video that kind of pans out, um, but it's still a really cool photo. But it was a photo slash video um, taken with Dr. with the drone that Dr. Rosenblum bought for his kids. Uh, and I say that <laughs> with quotes um, of just all the equipment that like the water equipment the trails has to offer. One thing I did forget to mention when I was talking about the dock is that dock's actually a boat too. So that dock can go into the middle of the lake. You can launch boats in and out of the dock there. Um, you can, they're also modifying the dock to be uh, driven with adaptive control controllers as well. Next slide. Okay, so lastly, we're gonna just show you the videos and they're just gonna run back to back to back. I've explained everything that you'll see in those videos and this is just really to give you a visual representation of what I'm talking about. And then after, as, uh, as the agenda says that we'll have another talk and then I'll be around for if you guys have any questions. So we can go ahead and start playing those videos. Oh, sorry, actually, let me explain them. The first one's the sailboat of the individual that was driving on using the ventilator. The second one is of uh, the little four-year-old I talked about is of him skiing. And the third one is the Tetra ski loading onto the chairlift that I showed some photos of. Okay. And then I just want to wrap up with the talk, 
uh, wrap up this talk with a big thank you to Cure FMA. Um, this is actually a photo of an individual that came out um, into 2019. Uh, after coming to one of the Cure SMA summits, and I think it speaks a lot to what Cure SMA does to bring us all together and bring us closer, even in times like this where we are a little bit more separated from each other than what we'd like to be. Uh, Cure SMA is here giving us the opportunity to tell you about a cool program that hopefully will bring us all together sometime soon. So thank you guys. That's all I got. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Melissa, for such a fantastic presentation. We're so glad to have you back with the Summit of Strength program. Um, and next up, we would now like to introduce Rose Domingo Horn, who is representing Biogen, who will be sharing their presentation, Biomarkers in SMA. Rose? Thank you so much. And that is an incredibly tough act to follow. Thank you, Melissa, for such an awesome presentation. Um, next slide, please. A biological marker or biomarker is an objective measure that can be used to indicate health or disease status in an accurate and reproducible manner. Disease biomarkers can serve many different purposes. They can inform diagnosis and prognosis, signal disease progression, or predict or monitor response to therapy. There's currently no gold standard biomarker for SMA, although different scales and measurements have been proposed. And with the availability of now three disease-modifying therapies for SMA and others under clinical development, the identification of an appropriate SMA biomarker is considered to be of critical importance. Next slide, please. As you know, Heterogeneity or diversity exists when it comes to how SMA affects different individuals and therefore how an individual with SMA can appear to others, including the clinicians who will diagnose and treat their disease. As such, there are unique challenges when it comes to the early and accurate diagnosis of SMA. Biomarkers may have utility in providing a diagnosis, informing prognosis and assessing disease activity in SMA. Next slide, please. In addition, biomarkers can be useful in guiding decision-making regarding treatment initiation and the monitoring of treatment response. Next slide, please. In certain diseases, biomarkers are essential to help facilitate treatment planning and decision-making in a tailored and personalized way. The repertoire of biomarkers used in clinical decision making is expanding, and there are currently a number that are under investigation and may show promise for future use. Next slide, please. Several different types of biomarkers exist, so I will give a few examples. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. There are biological or molecular biomarkers, for example, small molecules, metabolites, peptides, proteins, RNA, and DNA. Next slide, please. There are physiological biomarkers, for example, vital signs such as blood pressure, EMG or electromyography, and pulmonary function measures. Next slide, please. There are structural biomarkers, for example, imaging modalities such as ultrasound or MRI. Next slide, please. And there are histological biomarkers, for example, a tissue sample such as from a skin biopsy. Next slide, please. Neurofilament is a biological biomarker. Next slide, please. Neurofilaments are intermediate filaments that are uniquely expressed in neuronal cells. Next slide, please. And along with microtubules and microfilaments, they make up the cytoskeleton of neurons. Next slide, please. They are also essential for the radial growth or caliber of axons and the speed at which electrical impulses travel along them. Next slide, please. There are three isoforms of neurofilament that are divided according to their observed molecular weights. Next slide, please. These are referred to 
as neurofilament heavy chains, neurofilament medium chains, and neurofilament light chains. Next slide, please. If you look at this drawing here, the P's that are drawn along the neurofilament tail are there to illustrate that the majority of axonal neurofilaments are highly phosphorylated. And this is a characteristic that confers additional resistance to protein degradation. Next slide, please. Elevated levels of neurofilament are or have been detected in the blood and cerebrospinal fluid of several neurodegenerative neurological disorders, including ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, spinal bulbar muscular atrophy or Kennedy's disease, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. Axons are rich in neurofilaments, which may then be released into extracellular fluids when the axons are damaged or diseased. Elevated neurofilament levels in the CSF or serum are therefore often used as potential biomarkers of axonal injury, axonal loss, and neuronal death, although they have not been shown to have diagnostic utility for any given disease. Neurofilament light chain has been proposed to reflect acute or recent axonal damage, whereas neurofilament heavy chain may reflect chronic axonal damage. Next slide, please. SMA is characterized by a loss of motor axons and the abnormal accumulation of neurofilament in the distal axon at the neuromuscular junction. So the neuromuscular junction, or NMJ, is the synapse or connection between a presynaptic motor neuron and a postsynaptic muscle. In human SMA and mouse models of SMA, a pathologic hallmark of disease is the abnormal accumulation of neurofilament at the presynaptic terminal of the neuromuscular junction. This accumulation worsens over time and may result from a lack of SMN protein and dysregulation of neurofilament axonal transport. The remaining innervated neuromuscular junctions are structurally immature, characterized by impaired synaptic function and leading to eventual denervation. Studies in animal models have shown that this neuromuscular junction breakdown is an early event in SMA pathogenesis before motor neuron dysfunction and motor symptom onset. Next slide, please. Phosphorylated neurofilament accumulations have been observed in the neuromuscular junctions of patients with SMA. This slide shows different structures at the neuromuscular junctions in the diaphragms of healthy controls versus patients with SMA. Control patient tissue samples are shown across the top row, and tissue samples from patients with SMA are shown across the bottom row. On the bottom left, you can see neurofilament aggregations in the SMA patient, designated by the white arrows. In the center two columns, you can see that the abnormal neuromuscular junction structure in patients with SMA can be appreciated on staining of presynaptic structures, such as synaptophysin, and postsynaptic structures, such as acetylcholine receptors. Next slide, please. This slide will show baseline plasma neurofilament heavy levels in patients with differing types of SMA versus age-matched controls. In this graph, age is noted along the horizontal axis and neurofilament heavy chain levels are noted along the vertical axis. First, you see the baseline neurofilament heavy levels for healthy individuals without SMA, ranging in age from seven months to 18 years old. You may also notice here that in children without SMA, plasma neurofilament heavy levels were highest in the youngest infants. Next slide, please. Now superimposed on this, you can see higher baseline plasma neurofilament heavy levels in children diagnosed with symptomatic later onset SMA, those most likely to develop SMA type two or type three, ranging in age from two to nine years old. Next slide, please. 
Next, you will see even higher baseline plasma neurofilament heavy chain levels in children diagnosed with symptomatic infantile onset SMA, those most likely to develop SMA type 1, ranging in age from 20 to 211 days old. Next slide, please. Here in light pink, you will see data from infants with pre-symptomatic SMA diagnosed through genetic testing before the onset of symptoms and found to have three SMN2 copies, ranging in age from zero to six weeks old. Next slide, please. And finally, you'll see data from infants with pre-symptomatic SMA diagnosed through genetic testing and found to have two SMN2 copy numbers superimposed in dark pink on this slide. The age range for these children is one to five weeks of age. As you can see overall, baseline plasma neurofilament heavy levels are higher in children with SMA than in healthy children of the same age. In addition, you can see that median baseline neurofilament heavy levels were higher in pre-symptomatic infants with two SMN2 copies as compared to pre-symptomatic infants with three SMN2 copies. Next slide, please. This data overall supports the premise that neurofilament levels have potential as prognostic and predictive biomarkers. They may help to stratify patients for treatment and potentially to monitor treatment response. Next slide, please. In addition to neurofilaments, several other potential biomarkers are being researched in SMA. And please note that this list is not exhaustive, but some examples include biological or molecular biomarkers, including SMN2 copy number, as well as levels of SMN mRNA transcripts and SMN protein, neurophysiological biomarkers, including compound muscle action potentials and motor unit number estimations, which can be assessed with EMG studies, and structural biomarkers, for example, magnetic resonance neurography, which is an imaging study that can detect and quantify peripheral nerve involvement in different forms of SMA. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your time today. We at Biogen hope that you found this overview on biomarkers to be educational, and we very much look forward to further collaborations with Pure SMA and the SMA community. Thank you so much, Rose. Hi, everyone. This is Sarah with the Cure SMA Family Support Department. And next, I'm going to invite Melissa to come back and join us um, for her Q&A. And so we will go over some questions that came in from the community. Hi again, Melissa. Hi. OK, so it looks like our first question that actually just came in a little while ago. Um, with me, my SMA, oh, I'm sorry. With my SMA, when it's too cold, it my hands get frozen and my fingers get hard and I think it's hard to move. Is there any risk that we can lose control when skiing by ourselves? Um, I, I'm really happy you brought up that question. Uh, it's kind of something I forgot to mention. There's a couple things we have to help out. One is kind of the safety mechanism we talked about if we're in the Tetris ski uh with the tether and the remote control the other thing uh Charles has been really big on investing in and working in is heated clothing and so we actually have a slew of heated gloves and other heated clothing items to help with that kind of thermal regulation on the ski hill because absolutely um you know on a cold winter day it can get pretty rough temperature wise. Uh, and so that's been a big thing for us to uh, to kind of focus on. So I'm really happy you brought that up because it's something I kind of forgot to mention in the talk. Fantastic. I'm glad we got to cover that. Um, our next question, um, if a joystick or a sip and puff drive system isn't feasible to use, what are other options or are there any other options? So we don't currently have anything that's like ready to go right now that we could put on but uh 
for those who can't use a sip and puff or joystick, we're looking at using like muscle impulses and then programming them through. Those are, these are, this is still very much in the prototyping phase, but say if somebody really has good functional use in their thumb, but not enough to use a joystick, the sip and puff isn't feasible. Um, they could dictate, oh, if I flick this part of my thumb, the ski turns here. Or if I flick this way over here, if I activate this muscle, it turns here. Or even vice versa, if it's like, oh, I can flick something on my jaw and clench my jaw and that'll facilitate a turn. So that's one of the next steps we're working on as far as prototyping, but it's definitely not ready to go yet. Perfect, thanks for clarifying that. Then our next question that we have, how would I choose which equipment is best for me? You showed so many great things, but how do we decide? Um, really, I think the biggest thing about that is one thing we do as a practice at Trails is if it's the first time for people engaging in an activity such as skiing, is we'll do a fitting um, evaluation as well as a singular practice, simulator practice. So we have a big, kind of warehouse facility where you can come in and look at all the equipment and discuss things with the instructor and they'll help guide because uh, they're really well versed in the equipment help kind of guide what works um, based on your goals as well right like if um, if you're an individual that is ambulatory SMA you know maybe thinking and maybe you're interested in something that's not quite the Tetris ski uh, and you're you know you're going to be want to ski a lot and going about that then learning and like a bi ski or a mono ski um, would be appropriate however if you're that same individual and you're like i'm going to ski twice a year and i don't want to spend the whole day you know figuring it out in the sense of doing one turn kind of waiting for the next turn and i want to kind of be able to just go and ski with my family then the tetris ski is a good option there as well so sometimes it depends on your goals as well as your um like physical uh, um, phenotypes and, and limitations. And stuff like okay, perfect. And then we have time for one more question, it looks like. If my questions aren't answered on the websites, I know you sent uh, or you showed us those two websites to go to, what's the best way to get more information? And I'll just do a quick plug. If you have any questions um, and didn't catch any of that, you can always email us at family support at curasma.org, but I'll refer you back to Melissa for more information as well here. Yeah, perfect. Um, going through CureSMA, uh, we communicate really well together. And the other thing is, is I talked to it, I very briefly mentioned it off the cuff is that at the bottom of that trails website uh, is info. It's an email address like info at trails something uh, dot com, and that actually goes straight to like the program manager, uh, Keegan, and he gets sent back really quickly. So if you have any questions about, say, you were wanting to come out and see us, and you're like, oh, I'm thinking about dates, and I'm not sure, uh, sending an email along that line would be. Uh, the best approach and he managed, he follows that email very closely and efficiently, so. Wonderful, thank you so much again, Melissa. We really, really appreciate your um, fantastic information and it's always a great presentation and we were so glad to have you again today. Thank you so much for having me. Perfect, so we will go on to our final presentation for the day. I would like to introduce Jackie LeSage, who is representing Genentech, and she'll be sharing their presentation, a brief introduction to EVRISD. Jackie? Perfect, thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you, QSMA. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to represent Genentech and talk about EVRISD. Uh, the presentation I'm gonna give today will provide you with an introduction to EVRISD, which is proven to make a difference in infants, children, and adults with SMA. This is in people two months and older that have a broad range of symptoms and motor function. Next slide, please. My name is Jackie LeSage, and I'm a Partnership and Access Liaison, or PAL. A PAL is the local main point of contact from Genentech who support people living with SMA. We work 
the rest of the SMA, my SMA support team to help you throughout your treatment journey. This slide is a picture of all my fabulous PAL colleagues throughout the country from the East Coast to the West Coast and all of the great places in between. Many of us have healthcare backgrounds, like I myself was a PT, so I was super excited to hear um, about everything Melissa was saying. You guys are doing some great stuff. Um, but in this PAL role, we won't be providing any medical advice. Our focus here is to teach you about IVRISD so that you are more knowledgeable in your conversations with your healthcare provider. We can also provide more support in other areas, but I will talk more about that later in our discussion. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. During our short time together this afternoon, we will cover a brief overview of the RISD clinical story and available Genentech support services. We will talk about what RISD is, how it works, how it was studied, and what the results were. And we will also briefly go over how to take it as well as touch upon my SMA support. So we know that safety is top of mind for any medication you consider. So I will start there. Next slide. RISD is a prescription medication used to treat spinal muscular atrophy in adults and children two months of age and older. It is not known if RISD is safe and effective in infants under two months of age. Before taking RISD, tell your doctor if you have liver problems, are pregnant, or plan to become pregnant, or are breastfeeding or plan to breastfeed. RISD may harm an unborn or breastfed baby. Everesd may affect a man's ability to have children or his fertility. You will also want to tell your doctor about all the medicines you take. These are not all the possible side effects of Everesd, so please refer to additional important safety information throughout this presentation, and you can also get the full prescribing information at Everesd.com. Okay, so how does Everesd work? Next slide. As you more than likely know, the symptoms of SMA are caused by a lack of SMN protein in the body. Everisd is an SMN2 splicing modifier, which in less scientific terms means it works on a backup gene to help the body make and maintain more functional SMN protein. Continue. In our clinical trials, within four weeks of starting Everisd, SMN protein levels more than doubled and were maintained throughout 12 months of studies across all SMA types. So now you might be wondering, who did we study in these clinical trials? Next slide. It is important to note that Evrisdi is being studied in a broad range of infants, children, and adults with SMA. More than 450 people with type 1, 2, and 3 SMA from ages two months to 60 years old have participated in our trial. Continue. Efficacy, also known as effectiveness, was only studied, however, in people from two months to 25 years old. So now let's take a closer look at these studies. Next slide, please. Everisdi received FDA approval based on the results from the first 12 months of two ongoing studies. The first study is called Firefish, and it was designed for infants with type 1 SMA. It was a two-part study with 62 infants from two to seven months old. Part one of the study included 21 infants and focused on finding the recommended dose of Ibrisd in this age group, as well as also looking at safety and efficacy. Part two included 41 infants and looked even further into safety and effectiveness once the recommended dose was found. The second study is called Sunfish, and it was designed for children and adults with type 2 or 3 SMA. This was also a two-part study, and it included 231 participants ages 2 to 25 years old. 128 people in the study had type 2 SMA, while 52 had type 3. This study is a little different in the fact that it is a randomized placebo-controlled study, which is a mouthful. But placebo control just means that there were two groups of participants 
one that took a RISD while the other group took a liquid that did not have any active medication in it. This is known as a placebo. And randomized just means that the participants were randomly placed in one of these two groups. Part one looked at dose finding, while part two looked further into safety and effectiveness. There is a third supportive study called Jewelfish that is currently looking at the safety of Evrisd for people with type 1, 2, or 3 SMA who were previously treated with other SMA medications. This study is fully enrolled and ongoing. So that is how the studies were set up. So now let's look at the results. Next slide, please. In Firefish Part 1, Evrisd helped infants with type 1 SMA achieve a key motor milestone. After 12 months of treatment with Evrisd, 41% of these infants were able to sit for at least five seconds without support. Continue. And many of you know this is important since many untreated infants with type 1 SMA are not expected to achieve this milestone. Next slide, please. There were also some other observations in this study. Evrisi helped infants survive without permanent breathing support. At 12 months, 90% of infants were alive and could breathe without permanent support. And at 23 months, this percentage was 81%. Now we will review the results in children and adults studied in sunfish. So next slide, please. These participants treated with Evrisd showed improved motor function versus those not taking Evrisd. This change in motor function was assessed over 12 months and was measured by a test referred to as the MFM32. For your reference, the people who are taking Evrisd are represented by the blue line on the top and those that were not taking Evrisd are shown by the gray line on the bottom. You can see here by the demonstration of this graph that at the end of 12 months, the average score of those taking Evrisd went up by 1.36 points, while those that did not take Evrisd had an average score decrease by 0 0.19 points. Next slide, please. Now, as we talked about in the beginning of this presentation, we know that safety is top of mind for any medication you would consider. So let's talk about that next. As we mentioned before, Evrisd was studied in infants, children, and adults ranging from two months to 60 years old with types one, two, and three SMA. The most common side effects of Evrisd in infants with type one SMA were fever, diarrhea, rash, Symptoms of upper respiratory infections like runny nose, sneezing, sore throat and a cough, lung infection, constipation, and vomiting. For children and adults with later onset SMA, the most common side effects were fever, diarrhea, and rash. These aren't all of the possible side effects that can happen when taking FRSD. So when you're considering taking a medication, it's really important to talk to your doctor about the balance between the risks and the benefits. One important thing to note though, is that no one stopped taking this medication because of side effects in these clinical studies after 12 months of taking Evrisd. Safety in people previously treated with other SMA medications is currently being studied. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about how Evrisd is taken. Evrisd is the first and only medication to treat SMA with at-home dosing. It is a liquid medication that can be taken by mouth or given through a feeding tube. And because it's taken at home, it's delivered directly to your house and needs to be stored in a refrigerator. It is taken once daily and measured with the syringes that are always provided with the medication. As you know, treatment for SMA is a journey and Genentech offers a variety of support services that are collectively known as MySMA support to help guide you along this journey. Next slide. My SMA support is here for you. Pals like me are the main point of contact for my SMA support. My team and I are able to provide product education, information about insurance and financial assistance, coordination with the specialty pharmacy for deliveries and other support. We're able to meet with you virtually or over the phone. We can meet in one-on-one -on -one settings or even with other family members and caregivers if you prefer. Continue. 
One reminder though, is that a PAL does not provide any medical advice and it is not a substitute for a medical team. Your healthcare provider should always be your main resource for questions about health or medical care. Okay, so we have really covered a lot of information in a very small amount of time, so let's just quick review. Next slide, please, Kat. Everisd has proven to make a difference in infants, children, and adults with SMA. Everisd increased and maintained SMN protein levels in clinical studies. The safety of Everisd is being studied in people two months to 60 years old with type 1, 2, or 3 SMA. Everisd is the first and only oral treatment for SMA that is delivered to your door and taken at home. Continue. I would encourage everyone to talk to their healthcare provider to see if Everisd is right for you, and you can also visit www.everisd.com to learn more. Next slide. If you have any more questions, feel free to go to smasignup.com to connect to your local PAL in order to register. Continue. After you register, a PAL can then contact you and help answer the questions that you may have. Next slide. And that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time and for having me here today. Uh, thank you to Cure SMA for everything that you're doing. And Sarah, I pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Jackie, for, for sharing with us today. And a huge thank you to all of our, um, our wonderful speakers for, for your time and presentations today. Uh, we appreciate all of you who joined in on this webinar, and you will be receiving a follow-up email that includes a survey link, and we'd love to hear any feedback that you have to share. Also, we're incredibly grateful for the support from our sponsors um, for really making this Summit of Strength webinar series possible. And please check out the Cure SMA website for any of our upcoming virtual programs and webinars. And if there's anything that we can do for you or any questions we can help, you can always email us at any time at familysupport at curesma.org. Thank you all so much and have a great day.